All right, all right, here we go. Uh, we got a lot to cover today. We're in Genesis chapter 18. We're going to cover the entire 33 verses today. Um, I, I really I want to be careful as we get started. I'll just say it this way. I'm, we're an equal opportunity offender today. Everyone's going to get offended. That's where we're going. That's where we're going. And, and, I, and I do so not because uh, uh, I want to, but because I think that the Bible's going to speak in such a way that there's going to be some parts where it's just like, I'm uncomfortable. Uh, particularly for the ladies, uh, um, if you are a guest with us, you, uh, it's, it's new, it, may, it will be news to you, but typically we go after the guys. Oftentimes, I've heard it many times, well, why don't you go after the ladies? From ladies, then I preach a sermon like this, they all leave, and then we're like, why do we have so many guys here? Well, it's because of sermons like this, and so if you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. One of our ushers will uh, give you one if you don't own one. It's our gift to you. Uh, take it. You know, own it, keep it, read it. Uh, The Bible is about Jesus. We're going to meet Jesus here in our text today in Genesis chapter 18. Um, Last week we saw that God made a covenant with with Abraham. He made a covenant with him, uh, an everlasting covenant to him, his offspring. And uh, he told him that his wife, who was barren, would have a child. So today we're going to see God's going to come meet with Abram, his wife, his family. They live in tents. That's their home. And this is where we're at. And so we're going to, God's going to eat a meal with, with Abram. And a lot more is going to happen. A big conversation. You ever been over to a, someone's house, you've had a meal with someone, and, and throughout your time you found out some information that uh, you weren't really uh, expecting. Or um, you had a conversation that it got turned a little, um, it got a little hard, a little difficult. Uh, this is kind of the conversation that's going to happen today. A lot to cover. Genesis chapter 18, starting in verse 1. And the Lord, this is Yahweh, this is God, this is the Lord, this is the, the word here, the, the I am. God appeared to him, this Abram. By the oaks of Mamre, as, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. Again, so Abram's just chilling out. It's hot. He's sitting by the door of his tent, leaning back, relaxing, looking out into. At this point in time, Abram's, he's gathered a, a lot of wealth. He's, he's actually gathered uh, a lot of property. He's got a lot of land. He's, he's, he's old. He's around 100 years old, 99. He, he's pretty old. And he's just relaxing. You ever uh, met an old, old guy, you know, sitting around in the heat, just sitting back relaxing? This is Abram. Chilled out Abram. And the Lord's going to show up. He shows up. And as he said at the door, he lifted up his eyes. He's looking up. And behold, three men were standing there in front of him. All of a sudden, he's just sitting there. All of a sudden, three guys just show up at his doorstep. Literally three guys at his doorstep. Before we go any further, I need to tell you who these three guys are. Because uh, it's not very clear if you're just you're first reading through it who these three guys are. It's going to get more clear that these are respectable men. These are godly men or, or they're other men. These are, these are interesting type of men we're going to get to here in a moment. But, but first, uh, before we get there, I just want you to see, before we even get there, I want you to see that God shows up. Like God shows up. Before we get into any of the hard parts of the text, I want you to know that, that God is present even right now. His spirit is present. God has showed up, shown up. You showed up, he sh- he's shown up as well. Like he's here. He's in our midst. Every time uh, we gather, the Lord, of God, the, the Lord is here. Every time we open up the word of God, the, our, our God is present. It says when two or three are gathered in his name, like he is here. Like our God is here. He has shown up. And so I want you to see that God loves to appear. God loves to show up. God loves to meet with his people. He just made a covenant with Abram. He just said, you're my family. I, I, I am your God. You are my kids. I love you. I, I will have, have an everlasting covenant. I promise myself. I've committed myself to you. And so he, he, he's showing up and he's going to dine with Abram and his family. And so today I want you to see that the, the word of God is, is, is here for the present. It's here to speak to us today. And so the Lord loves to visit. He's going to dine in. He's going to commune with his people, Abram, his wife, today, here in our text. Just like I love, I don't know about you, well, I, I don't know about you and your kids, but me and my kids, I love being around my kids. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love eating food. I love eating dinner. We love feasting at our house. We love it. We love it. God loves to meet with you, his children. And so God is assuring his, his, his family here, this royal family, Abram and his wife, he's assuring them of the covenant in which he just made with them. That's what's happening. God is showing up. He, he's, he wants to prepare, he wants Abram to prepare, prepare a meal for him. I know that's weird for you. So you're like, why isn't God preparing the meal if he wants to host? Like, nope. I lived in Kenya for a little bit, and this is their custom too. Uh, when it's your birthday, 
you serve everybody. Like, that's a weird custom. As Americans, we're like, no, like, we get served. No, nope. when, when the guest of honor shows up, the guest of honor is the one serving. Abram, God shows up, and, and God's going to have Abram uh, make a meal for him. But I want you to see that God is ensuring and assuring his people he, by having a meal with them that, that he has a covenant of peace. A covenant of peace is with them, between them. There's no enmity between Abram and God. He's been made righteous. His sins have been forgiven. His wife, Sarai, they believe they've been counted righteous. And so I want you to see that because if we don't understand that, we get into this conversation that's going to have, that we're going to have today. And it's going to be a difficult one. If you don't understand that God is for you today and he wants to meet with you today, even if he has a stern word for you or a hard word or a rebuke for you, if you don't know he's good and he's God and he's for you, you will flee. You will run when you hear conflict, especially when it proceeds from the mouth of God. So this sets the stage. God is for Abram. He is for Sarah. He loves them. He wants to, and he's made a covenant with them. We saw that last week. And so he, God shows up with two other guys. And, and so there's these three men. I want you, uh, who are they? It's Jesus and two angels. How do I know that? Well, in Colossians 1.15, it, clear, it's clear that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. And so we've seen it before that, that with, with Melchizedek, it was potential that this was a, this was a, a, a theophany, a, a pre-incarnate Christ maybe coming to make his presence known. Here uh, we see a, a similar thing. But, and we see it, and we know this because he's called the Lord. He's called Yahweh, the I Am. I Am visited him. And he looked like a man. Three men showed up. One, this is a man. The, the only man, male, physical earthly human form of the invisible God is the Lord Jesus. We believe in one God existing in three eternal persons, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're all existing eternally, all the time, always. So it's not that the God the Father came out down to heaven and is appearing as Jesus, and, and, then, and then he's going to go back up, and it's going to be uh, some, and God's in heaven, and, but now he's on earth here, and so God's not there. No, this is the, the second member of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus, showing up to have a meal with Abram. This is awesome. And how else do we know this? Uh, well, we, we also know in John 1, 18, that, that no one knows what, what God the Father looks like. He, he's invisible. Jesus is the exact imprint, the image. We are told throughout the New Testament. Jesus is showing up. He, the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus is showing up to Abram to have a meal with him, to meet with him. He's going to show up. The two guests with him, the other two men are angels. We're going to find that out next week. At the end of chapter 19, Yahweh, the Lord Jesus, is going to leave the scene. He's going to exit stage right, and there's going to be two angels left. And we're told in, in chapter 19 that then, after God leaves, the two angels head into Sodom. So we, we know that, that there's two angels. Those are two of the characters here. And then two of these men, and then one of these men is named God. Who's that? The Lord Jesus. That's who, we are. That's who we have here. So Jesus shows up with his two buddies, Angel A, Angel B. They're nameless, but these two angels, they show up. And they show up in, in, in the heat of the day. Abram's hanging out. He sees these men show up. And what happens? What happens? He lifted up his eyes. He saw them. And then he, when he saw them, he ran from the tent to meet them and bow down to the earth. That's how you know they're, they're important, guys. Like, you wouldn't just... Ran, uh, this is a 99-year-old man, Middle Eastern man. I don't know if you know anything about Middle, Middle Eastern culture, but they, one, they don't run. Men do not run, especially the older guys. And then two, 99 years old, you probably don't have much running left in you, and he runs. And then what does he do? He bows down. Abram's the patriarch. He's the man. His guests should be bowing to him unless they're the Lord Jesus Christ. He bows down. He bows down and he puts his face in the dirt. Just imagine this. This Middle Eastern dude, he's, he's hot. He's been hanging out all day, 99 years old. And he's going to run and meet Jesus. Falls down on his face. And then what he says, he says, oh, Lord. Again, this is a, this is a word used to not, not as a, a word here to prescribe like, oh, Lord. Like he's speaking, you know, English, uh, British literature. No, he, he's speaking, oh, like Adonai, God. If you have found favor, or if I found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be, bro uh, be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourself, and, and uh, sit under this tree while I bring you a morsel of bread. You don't find out later he's going to throw a feast. The morsel, small, he's going to throw a feast. That you may refresh yourselves, and after you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. 
What's going on here is Abram is, is getting ready to, to play host. He sees the Lord Jesus. He's like, man, I've got, you, you don't go anywhere. Let me bring you some water so you can wash up. It's hot outside. Let's, let's wash up. Let's wash your feet. Let's wash your hands. Let's, let, it, let's, let's actually, let's bring you some food. Let me go get some food. Like for us, like we, we would go, like, let's go to our pantry. Or like, let's, let's uh, you know, DoorDash something. Nothing's made right now. <laughs> he's planning for a long time. Let's, he, he's going to host. And see, let's, let's, let's watch what he does. He says, uh, and then, so they say, do as, you, do, do as you've said. And Abram went quickly to the tent. This is what the first thing he does. And men, you need to take note. If you're married especially, first thing you do, men, if you are preparing to host someone and you're out of your, your league, you don't know what to do, you go get your wife. That's what he does. Sarah, I just said to these, Jesus is here. He's here. He has two buddies. Don't know who they are. A- Abram doesn't know their angels at this point. He just knows there's two men with Jesus. I don't know them. They're here. I told them we were going to give them uh, a little feast. And so what do we need to do? Quick. This is what he said. Quickly, he ran to her. Again, he's running. And, and he said, quick, Sarah, uh, uh, three, she has a, a fine flower. Get it, get it. This is like gallons of flour. I mean, we're talking a lot of flour. And he says, need it. Not that I need it, but like need the bread. Like make it. This is, a, this is not going, I, I, you know, go down to H-E-B, get some real quick. This is going to be a, a, a longer process. And let's make cakes or, or, or rolls or bread. Like this is, let's make some bread. And Abram, Abram still, he's got to be exhausted, old man, and ran quickly to the herd. He went out to the field, found a, took a calf. It was tender and good. He's going to make the best steaks for, 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 for the Lord Jesus. And he gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. He's killing the calf that day. This isn't going down and going to the butcher who butchered that day. This is going to the guy who's got the calf. He's still mooing. And he's like, I want that one. He looks tender. Let's make steaks for Jesus. This is, some of you are weirded out by that. Some of you are now vegetarians because of it. And that's okay. It's okay. I get weirded out by the next part. And he took uh, curds and milk. And that's just gross. I, but they loved that. And, and the calf that he had prepared. And he set it before them. He's throwing a feast. Like, this is awesome. And I, 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 some of you know that my, my wife and I love to host. We love to, I love steaks. I want you to know it's not just because I love the taste of meat. I, this is a true story. It is birthed out of a, our conviction, truly a conviction, a biblical conviction of hospitality. And that's what we see what's going on here. Abraham is practicing hospitality. He, he takes the position of a host. He could have had anyone go, hey, servant, go run and get my wife. Tell her to make the food. He, he, he sees to it himself to go make sure it happens because he has a guest. It's the Lord Jesus, and he wants to make sure everything's good, everything's great for him. And so they stood by under the tree, and they ate. They, they, or he stood by uh, under the tree while they ate. So it, it, I don't know if he's eating with them or he's just watching them going, man, is it good? Good cow, right? Pretty good. It was a tender one. It was tender and good. That's what I told the young man. Make it how you like it. I, Jesus, how do you like your steaks? How do you think you liked them? Perfect. That's how I liked them because he was perfect. And this is what's going on. Abraham is practicing hospitality. Hospitality is what I would like to call a spiritual discipline. Some of you are like, oh, nope, that's Bible reading. And hospitality. It is a spiritual discipline. And I'll, I'll, I'll make my case here in a moment. What it is is a, it's the discipline of, of welcoming, hosting, uh, and caring for visitors, namely strangers, uh, especially, especially in this time, uh, uh, in, in ancient times, it was those who were passing through, just like these men, passing through. And oftentimes it was unsafe for someone who was not from that area to pass through and stay at like a hotel uh, or, uh, or, or a place like that. Or it, so it was, it was oftentimes that the people of God were, were commanded, as we're going to see here and later, that they're commanded to be hospitable for those people who are passing through and actually welcome them into their house care for them. This is a, an art that we've lost as Americans, pretty much. Like, you go to other parts of the world, like India and, and even Africa, like, you show up. When I was in Africa, I showed up every place we went to. Man, they're rolling out. They're, it's tea time. They're making dinners. I mean, it's, it's exactly like this. It's like, man, I was just coming by to say hello. Like, yep, yep, yep. We're going to roll out everything for you. Well, we only have one one like bag of tea left. We're, we're going to spend it on you. This is the type of, this is hospitality that I think other cu- cultures and customs get really well that we've lost as a country. 
but are commanded as Christians to practice. And so in our day, um, it's, not, it's not necessarily people who are driving through. It's not like everyone's house has to be the Airbnb. That's not what we're saying here. Contextually, what this would look like are, are strangers or, or people you just don't know. Oftentimes we, we, we like to think about it as, term, as far as uh, uh, thinking about typically non-Christians. If Christians are going to be hospitable, we, we typically think it's, it's non-Christians, but, but not necessarily. These guys that, that, Jesus is, or that uh, Abram is hosting, uh, there's the Lord Jesus who is the epitome of, of Christian, like that's where it comes from, and then two angels. These dudes, these are, not, these are not ungodly folks. These are God's men. This is God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus. And so, but he, he doesn't know these men. They're strangers to him. He's met Jesus before. He has not met these other two men. So he's going to be hospitable. He's going to host. So in our day, this could be, this could be uh, uh, non-Christians. Definitely should be at some point. And it could also be just someone you know or you don't know. Or the fact that you, you would leave your home open to where you're inviting someone to maybe a get-together, a party. And then they're like, hey, can I bring, bring a friend? Yeah, absolutely. And, and they know them, they bring them, and it's like, man, I don't really know that person, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to treat them like they're friends, treat them like they're family, and host. And so what, what does he do when, when they're hosting? What, he, does he get the, he, I mean, I don't know how much flour they had, but it seems like he says, make it all. Like, I don't know how much bread we're going to need, but these guys, they look tired, they look like bread guys, let's get it all. That's what they're doing. This is a lot of flour. And then we see, like, he kills a whole cow. It was a calf, yeah, whatever, but it's like a lot, like some people go in to, to butchering a cow or, or getting a cow and like feeds them for a year. I mean, we're talking like there's no refrigerators, they're feasting. This is going down. This is awesome. And so when you host people or when you're, you practice hospitality, to, uh, one category we're thinking about, it, or, or am, I, am I allowing people to come into my home who are not like me, who are strangers, who are, who are maybe different? And then also, am I, am I hosting them in such a way that I would, uh, whether Christians or non-Christians, I don't know, or that I'm hosting them, am I doing it in such a way that I'm treating them like I would my family, or even better? Like my family, we get the fattened calf like once a year, like for, for guests, man, we're going we're gonna to roll out the red carpet. That's what hospitality, that's what Christian hospitality is. It's, it's saying, hey, I, I don't know you, and you don't know me. And for some, you're passing through, let me host you, let me invite you in. And this is what we do every Sunday. We want to create an environment at, at, the, at church when we gather to, that's hospitable. Whether you are Christian, non-Christian, whether your friends are Christian, whether your friends are non-Christian, whether you're visiting from out of town, or, you, or you've lived here your whole life. Like we want to be hospitable. And moreover, we want to not just practice hospitality here on a Sunday, but we want to do so in our homes throughout the week. And so... One of the qualifications, actually, for an elder in the New Testament is that the elder would be hospi- hospitable. So any of you guys who want to be an elder, or you want, to, you, want to, you want to be a pastor in the church, like, you have to be hospitable. It's one of the qual- character qualifications. Because it's an issue of the heart. It's not an issue of do you have money, do you have space, do you have land, do you have opportunity. The issue here is the issue of the heart. Like, I, I truly believe that, that hospitality, the, the practice of hospitality, exposes our heart. I mean, look at, ladies, how many of you are like, she's like needing bread? Like, she's starting from scratch. They killed, like, this seems like a lot. Like, Abram, why didn't you consult me on this? Right? Like, you met this, I get it, it's Jesus, but we didn't have a conversation. We didn't have a meeting. It was like, to, you told, the guy's already butchered the cow. Are we, we're doing this. And so what we see here is, 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 is Jesus and the angels are, are being recipients of this hospitality. He knows it's Jesus, but he doesn't know these two angels or, or angels. They think, he thinks they're regular men. In Hebrews 13, it actually references this, this scene. In Hebrews 13, it says that, that some of you in your hospitality you're actually entertaining angels and you don't even know it. You don't even know it. And so Abram, what he is doing here is what, what we find Jesus doing with Zacchaeus in the New Testament. Jesus shows up and he says, he says, hey, Zacchaeus, I'm here. I'm coming to your house today. What does Zacchaeus do? Zacchaeus, not a Christian. He's a tax collector, a sinner. He, the, the religious elite of the time would not have wanted uh, a guy like Zacchaeus, especially the Jews, would not have wanted Zacchaeus in their home. Jesus sees him, he's in a tree, we sing songs about him, and he says, uh, 
Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm not suggesting it. I'm not asking it. I'm telling you, I'm coming over for dinner. Imagine if Jesus shows up and says, hey, I'm coming over for dinner. Do you have the heart of hospitality that says, yes, Lord, come on. Come on. In Revelation 3, we see that at the very, at the very end of time, uh, we see that in Revelation 3 that Jesus himself says, hey, I stand at the door. I'm at your house. And I knock. If anyone hears my voice, hey, let them open the door. Guess what? I'm going to come in and I'm going to eat with you like we're friends. We, we take the, the verse like at Revelation 3, 20, and we, we say, we go like, well, this is God's at the door of your heart. He's just knocking. Like he's knocking to, to not just, and I get it, he's, he's knocking at the door of your heart. He wants to enter and he wants to feast with you. He wants to dine with you. Are you, hospi- he, are you hospitable? This is, we th- see this throughout the entire Old Testament and New Testament, this, this, this meals. We're going to take the Lord's Supper later. It's a meal. So many shared relationships can be had around meals and conversations can be had around meals. One of the, the authors of the New Testament described Jesus mostly as a man who came eating and drinking. They're like, we know Jesus. He's the guy who's always eating. He's always drinking. He was never a, a, a glutton. He didn't overeat. He was never a drunkard. He didn't overdrink. But he was always around the party where they're eating and drinking. And what does he show up here? He shows up. Hey, boom, let's do this. Let's eat. Let's feast. He does it. And hospitality is, I believe, a lost art in our, in our country, in our, in our world today. Or I would say it's a lost art among even Christians, but more so even in our day, in our age, in our, and even pre-COVID. Um, it, we, we tend to only like to hang out with people who are like us. Like, that's typically, this is not hospitality. Hanging around with people who are only like you, that's not hospitality. It's the welcoming, inviting of, of strangers, those people who think differently than you, who are different than you. And so in, in our world, uh, you know, this is pre-COVID. We, they we're already on the de- decline of actually families having meals together, but then moreover, having your friends to come over for dinner. It was, it was on the decline in our country before COVID. Now it's been totally almost extinct. But before, uh, and you know what was before COVID, what was happening was that the increase of fast food and eating out was, was on, the, on the rise. Now, DoorDash, everything else, like that's what we do. We don't eat together as a family. We don't, the, the table is not the center of the house. What's the center of the house is now the TV. And so this is, architecturally we've changed as a country. Uh, even even, the, even our, our houses are built, that they're smaller, they're not built to host. Used to, you would have a room that you, if you could afford it, and, and if you were thinking this way because you wanted to host, not only would you have a porch in which you could sit outside and talk to your neighbors and talk to the people in the community, but also you would have a room that you, you ate in, the center of your house was, was the, the dining table, and then you would have a room that you would, you would hear the old English folks say, they'd go retire to this room, and they would, they would, they would, they would, they would have tea or they would hang out they would continue a conversation that was a that was a hospitality gesture now what we do is we go hey come on in let's watch the game put on the tv and like we'll talk at during during commercial breaks like that's the that's the only hosting that we know how to do in our day I'm not saying don't go to someone's house and watch the game. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that's typically becoming one of the only ways that we know how as a country to host as, as Americans. And you know, moreover, Christians should be the type of people who, who, who lean into biblical hospitality and create not the center of their home, their TV, but the, the table. Why? Because in Jesus' home, guess what his, what's the center? His table. Where are we feasting at the, at the wedding feast of the land? Like that's the center. That's where we're going. New heavens, new earth will be feasting with Jesus forever in eternity. He'll be at the head. He'll, he'll be at the head. And we don't know uh, Peter or James and John, you know, they're, they're fighting over who's at the right and who's at the left. Probably any of those guys. We're going to go to the table. We're going to go to the, the Lord Jesus' table at his home. He's preparing, right? He's preparing a, a place for us. A new heaven, a new earth. He's going to act as host for us who were strangers who became friends, who were enemies of God who became his friends. And so our world is a world that, that not only doesn't know how to practice hospitality, and it's a lost art form, but moreover, uh, we, we've, it's even been, been uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it's, it's, it's because of COVID, I'm not saying that there haven't been real uh, causes for, for maybe distancing or whatever, but what I'm saying is like even now more than ever, that's the last thing that's coming back in our world is hospitality. Like, we, we only know hospitality industry is, like, going out to eat. 
Christian hospitality is, hey, come over to my dinner table. Let me make food for you. You're like, I'm not really good at it. You know how to YouTube stuff. Like, come over. Come over. Come to my home. I want to host you. Now, some will say, and, and some will say this. They will object. And they'll say, well, I, I just, I'm just not comfortable with people in my house. This is before COVID. People said, I'm just not comfortable. Like, I don't trust that person. I, I, I just, well, Al, you're saying everyone, anyone who, who shows up and says, I want to go to your trial, say, I, you should just let them in. Like, isn't there a filter for, for who should come over? Like, I don't know if I trust them. Typically, if that's your heart, that's your response, like you have a heart issue. You have a heart issue. I, I really firmly believe that's your response. Your first, if your response is objecting to any sort of thing that, in regard to hospitality, the problem is probably there's something on, going on in here. I'm not saying there's not legitimate reasons. Like, like there are certain people you might not should let in your house. Maybe uh, some guy who wants to, you know, has a death threat on you. And he's like, hey, man, I want to kill. Like Paul didn't go, hey, guys who want to kill me, let's, let's come on in. Or even Jesus, when they tried to, he, he left the party. Like, he was discerning. I'm not saying don't be discerning. But typically, if your default is going, hey, I just, nope, I have red flags. I want you to say those red flags should be red flags to your heart. And I said this earlier, and I'll say it again. I think I said it. But practicing hospitality, I think, exposes our heart. I think, moreover, it exposes our prejudice. My, I, I know someone who... who said this. Uh, it's, it's someone I, I know dearly. Uh, they're, they're older. Um, they're like my grandmother's age. But, uh, and, and her kids, I know her kids. And, and uh, they grew up in a, in a, in a time when, 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 uh, when, the, when the schools came back together or came together after segregation, right? They, came to, they integrated these schools. And, and she, her kids grew up believing that it was unsafe for them to go to school. They found out later it wasn't unsafe. It was just like there were black people there. And they weren't, and so they're like, they grew up their whole life thinking it was unsafe to go to school. It, that really wasn't the case. And so, so hear me out. I'm not saying like every, every instance where you're like, I don't want to go to this or I don't want to do this or I don't want to invite these people into my home. I'm not saying that every example is a prejudice, but I want to say, check your heart for them. Like, I don't want to let these people over to my house because they're, they're what? I just, they're not like me awesome. It's called hospitality. If you're ever going to practice it, only those people are, are going to be a part of that crew. That's true. And so what is it? What is the reason? And, and, and this is, what is the reason? Well, I don't know if they've, and this is not a political statement. Please hear me. It's just a real, it's a real thing that people are really saying, well, someone I know in my family is like, well, I don't know that I want to come to that event, a family event, because not everyone's vaccinated. And so now, I'm only, I will only be around people who are vaccinated. And I take the moral high ground because I am better than them because they're unsafe. Like, right, this is what we do. We, we figure out our position, and then we find out reasons to undermine and, and actually create distance between us and someone else. It happens on the right and to the left. It's not, again, this is, I'm asking, is that really your heart? Are you really, and, and, for this person, they, they spend a lot of other time in a lot of other places with a lot of un, other unvaccinated people, and they don't social distance. So it, the matter is not, do, do they really think that they're unsafe? The matter is, they want to pick and choose that card when they want to not be hospitable. Christians, we can do the same thing. So my, my point here is not to say all of you are just prejudiced, and then if you don't want to be hospitable to a person, there's something wrong with you. I'm saying, check your hearts. Why? Why? I mean, to be fair, like the Lord Jesus says, and the Apostle Paul says about the Lord Jesus and about the new heavens and the new earth, he says that, that it's, to die is gain. So if the worst case scenario, you do invite the murderer over and they kill you and you're a Christian, you get to go see Jesus. Like, it can't get worse. It can only get better. And so Christians who, who live with heavenly minded and understand that, that, that there is a dinner feast waiting for them in the new heavens and the new earth. And if they spend all their money and they, they, they spend all of their, use all their flour and they have to go to the store the next day to host for someone. Man, it's worth it. Because they know in the new heavens and the new earth they have infinite 
parties and feasts forever in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Another reason why we might object is because it's exhausting. Hosting is exhausting. Anyone ever done it? My wife and I, we love to host. Uh, my wife loves to, to host uh, showers and parties and all these things. And all the time, it's just exhausting. It's, it's exhausting. It also takes sacrifice of time, also finances. It, takes, it actually takes a uh, uh, sacrifice of your space. It, it, and in Jesus' day, it could cost you reputation. But this is the cost of, 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 of Christian hospitality. You have to be willing to go, I'm ready to get wrung out. I'm ready to get exhausted to host other people. Because I want them to see that, that when we have a feast and, and we, we have the best steaks and we, we, we have you at our table, I want them to see this is a taste of heaven. Like there's a day coming where I'm going to be feasting with the Lord Jesus forever. And so I want you to know that if you liked this party, there's a greater one. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus, then let me introduce you. Well, you have objections? Awesome, let's talk about it. So much ministry can be done at the dinner table if you maximize, if you use it. But if you only, when you're hosting, talk about the weather, avoid conversations, you're never going to get anywhere. We're going to get into some difficult conversations. Before we do, I want to give you some encouragement to host, to be, to practice hospitality. Matthew 25, 35, it says, For when I, this is Jesus saying, well, For when I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty. And you gave me drink. I was a stranger. And you welcomed me. This is literally what's going on in Abram in our, in, our, in our passage. Jesus is a stranger passing through to him and two angels. And he's, Abram's practicing hospitality. I want you to see this. this Abram get, is getting this divine appointment from the Lord Jesus. And Abram's heart is a heart that wants to host. And he's hosting. He's welcoming in. Literally the Lord Jesus. But Jesus says, hey, when you do it to the, uh, the rest of this passage, we'll say, whenever you do unto the least of these people, you do to me. And when you're hosting someone, when you're inviting someone in, or, I want to encourage you to not think just about who they are, but who they could be. They could be an angel. That's what in Hebrews 13, verse 2 says, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Thereby some have entertained angels. It could be an angel. Or it could be the Lord Jesus, like, like, like Abram. Like he, Jesus is telling us in Matthew 25 that we should think about these people whenever we serve anyone. We're, we're hospitable to them. Like we're doing so as if we're doing to the Lord Jesus. So how does Abram host the Lord Jesus? Fat, the, 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 young cat, the tender good meat he's going to put on the grill. He's going to make some bread. He's going to host. Well, and in 1 Peter 4, 9, it says, show hospitality hospitality to one another without grumbling. That's the kicker. <laughs> Have you ever been like, man, I'm just, when it comes to everything you just said, I get it, I see it, but mm, grumble, grumble, grumble. Like, that's you. You're like, some of you are the most grumbly people when it comes to hospitality. Some of you, you're like, my wife has the gift of it, and I don't, so like, what do we do? You, well, you do, you follow Jesus. You, you're hospitable. But do so in a way that's not grumbling. So if you're a grumbling, hospitable person, that's, those are oxymorons. But if you're a person who, who tries to practice hospitality and you find yourself grumbling, praise God. It helps you know that when you act like Jesus, you don't want to be like Jesus. And it's good. You're like, I, I, my sin's exposed. Or when you practice hospitality and you find yourself certain prejudice, it could be, it doesn't have to be race. It could be, it could be um, a socioeconomic. It could be. They like guns. I don't like guns. It could be they like a certain political party. I don't like that. It could be anything. It could be they have a beard and they're bald, and I don't like balded beard people. Like, that's okay. Like, it's okay to name it. It's just not okay to stay there. So examine your heart. Are you grumbling? Is something coming up keeping you from being hospitable? Jesus is clear. When you do so, you do you, you, you should serve and be hospitable as if he's showing up to dinner. Two, so that means you make good food. And then two, according to your means. I'm not saying you have to go take out a loan to do this. Don't hear me say this. Anyone can do this in any way. It doesn't matter. I've, I've had some of the most hospitable moments in my life from the, most, the, the poorest of people in the world. Like in Kenya. In the slums of Kenya, I had this. It was actually literally we're God, in Psalm 23, it says that God prepares a table for us in, in front of our enemies. 
This lady, we, she met the Lord Jesus. She got saved, and so she invited us into her house. And, 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 and we, she made a meal. And while that was going on, there was a raid on the compound that we were supposed to be at. Armed people coming to kill us or take us captive or well, I don't know what they're going to do. And, and, and in that moment, this lady, she's, she's, she's giving everything she has, all that she has. Literally, afterwards, she was like, I don't know how I'm going to pay for my rent. I don't know how I'm going to get groceries tomorrow. And she wasn't doing it out of a way to, to say, like, you know, now you owe me. She was, we found out later, like, her story. It was awesome. She, she was so hospitable. Jesus says, when you even give a, a cup of water to his disciples, man, great will your, be your reward. The faith of this woman was amazing. I'm telling you, you don't have to be well, well off to be hospitable. You just have to have a heart that's hospitable. And now, during this hospitable moment, they're over meal. It's at that point in time in the meal where they're, they're going to start talking. Jesus is going to get real. Some of you have been over to someone's house, and they're like, hey, they brought you over to talk to, about, about something. This is that part. What we need to understand is the big idea is there's nothing too difficult for God, but let's talk about why that, that, that matters. Verse 9, and they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. They're hanging out. She's, she's in the home. And the Lord said, so this is Jesus talking, sure, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. They've been waiting for this. They've been waiting for this moment. They're going to have a son, and Sarah's going to have this. has been promised, and Jesus says, hey, I am here to show you. i got good news. The meal was good. Steaks were perfect. You're going to have a son. What a great day. What a great day, right? Like if you were trying to have kids, and you, and you just got your favorite meal, and you had the best news, like that would be awesome, right? What if you waited a long time? Even better, right? Not for Sarah. And Sarah was listening in the tent next, uh, behind the, the door behind them. And now Abram and Sarah were old. <laughs> Hebrew for old. Advanced in years. He, she was about 90. He was 99-ish. And the way of women had, had ceased to be with Sarah. This is, this is menopause is in the, in the rear view mirror for her. Like, it's so far gone. Like, she's, she's like, no, no, not having kids. And so Sarah laughs to herself. And I want you to see the difference between Sarah laughing. Because when Abram heard this news last week, if you remember, he laughed too. But what's going on here it was a word play there. Was, was, when Abram laughed, it was a word play to signify Isaac's name would be laughter. This laugh is a mockery. This is a, I don't believe you, God. This is a, a cursing of God. This isn't, ha I can't have kids. Funny, funny, funny. This is a, like, how dare you? This is a mockery of the Lord. And she's speaking to Jesus. And she says, after I'm worn out and my Lord, uh, her husband, is old, I shall have pleasure. Two things that are going on here. One, it's, it's potential. Some commentators will say they haven't been sleeping together for a while. So she's like, really? Really, that guy? Like, this is going to happen? Like, after the Hagar thing, like, we kind of stopped. Or it's referring to the ability to conceive. Either way, she's going, man, after, now, now, God, after all this time. Like, you told me 25 years ago this was going to happen. It didn't happen. So, you know what? I took matters into my own hands. I told Abram to go sleep with Hagar, my maidservant, and he got pregnant. Clearly it works for him. What about me? And now I hate that woman, and she hates me, and I sent her away, and now she's back. Because you told her to. And now you think that you can just show up here and we make a meal for you and you can just bless us with a baby? Like, who are you, God? This is the heart here. So ladies, I want you to see that, that typically this is how women sin, secretly. Men sin or is often visible. Like, you know a guy sin. Like, typically it's, it's, it's outward. I don't know if that's because it's because guys don't know how, like, to, to not boast about everything. Like, guy, guys are, guys are they're, they're, they can't conceal anything. Women are great at concealing. They're really good at it. And, and this is why in the New Testament, some of you are like, why is this, can only be applied to women? No, it can be applied to men too, but typically, this is how women sin, inwardly. You see this throughout the New Testament when Paul is constantly rebuking women for being gossipers, so they're talking about women behind their back and other people behind their back. This is exact, this is literally what she's doing. She's mocking the Lord Jesus behind his back. The next, like, hmm. Really? 
This is, whether it's gossiping, whether it's slandering, whether it's, it's, it's busybodies we hear in the New Testament, this is oftentimes what we see, especially in Christian women, they, they, they look good on the outside, they put themselves together, they come to church, they say, they, they, they bless you, pastor, you know, they, they, they're really, they're really, they love one another, they show up to community groups, they're great hosts, they, they bring food. But inwardly, man, they're cursing God. Inwardly, they're cursing their husband. Inwardly, they're, they're cursing other people. You can't see it, so you don't know it. But the Bible tells us that Jesus sees it, and he knows it. And he's going to respond to her. Women, oftentimes, you're like Pharisees. Not that you're religious piety. But Jesus says that the Pharisees were like whitewashed tombs of decaying flesh. Good looked good on the outside, but on the inward, wicked, vile, sick. And you're like, God, are we allowed to? This is the one sacred cow in the church that you're not allowed to say. You're not allowed to say any of that. Like that, that gets you canceled in our world today, but that also gets, like, you don't say that. Especially in San Antonio where matriarchs are, 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 the, are the golden calf. She's the matriarch. She's cussing, cursing the Lord Jesus. She thinks that she's going to be pious outwardly. She can just hide in her room and just, the men outside, have you ever been there? Like, oh, the men are doing this. You just mock your husband, women. You mock the men. You mock, you mock you're just like, and, and then you get girls together and you will talk about those things. We've inherited that from Eve, but also our mother, Sarah. Okay, God, really? You're going to do this now? And then in verse 13, God's going to address her. He's not even in the room with her. This is awesome. And then the Lord said to Abram, I want you to see who is he going to talk to? Who is he talking to? God shows, Jesus is talking to Abram. It's exactly what happens in in the garden. Uh, Adam sins because Eve ate the fruit first. Who Who does God show up to first? Adam. He, he holds Adam accountable for Eve's sin. Sarah's not even in the room. And he says, Abram. He addresses her. He says, Abram, why does Sarah laugh and say, shall I, I shall indeed, or shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Like, do you know me? Like, I'm the creator of the heavens and the earth. Like, I've been so near to you, Abram. I bless you, I bless you. Like, do you not see this? I've been promising you. Last chapter we made a covenant. Is anything too hard for me? And he says, at the appointed time. He's like, I don't care if she believes. I don't care if she mocks me. I don't care. At the appointed time, I will return. About this time next year, Sarah will have a son. It doesn't matter if she agrees. It doesn't matter if she laughs. It doesn't matter if she mocks me. It doesn't matter. She's not God. I am. And I told you she's going to have a child, and she will have a child. You're like, well, what if they stop, they, they don't sleep together? You heard about Mary, mother of Jesus? He can do that one too. Like, it doesn't matter. No one can thwart the will of God. At the appointed time, this will happen. But then Sarah hears this, and she, she comes out, she denies it. I did not laugh. For she was afraid. How, how many of you ever, it, you've been caught in your sin, lied to cover it up? Who is she lying to, though? Jesus, looking him in the eye. I mean, that's some guts, one. But two, this is showing the hardness of her heart. Because if she can lie to Jesus face to face, it probably came out of a pattern of lying to him and in, 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 in mocking him behind his back what are the passages in scriptures lady that you don't like like I don't want to obey those oh I found a a guy with a PhD that says that that's not what submission means like we don't believe in those anymore like someone who's really smart tells me this and so I'm going to follow that one we pick and choose we do origami on the text and we edit things out ladies you do it all the time because you have a hard heart towards God And it's my job as the pastor to, to, to be clear that women sin too. Women harden their hearts to the Lord Jesus often. It's often the ones who look the most pious on the outside that are the most wicked inside. 
Any ladies, do, do the ladies you know know your struggles? Like, do they know? Like, or, or, or is it you only tell the ladies how good you're doing, how much the Lord is blessing you, how you prayed and he answered? Like, do you, when y'all come together, ladies, do you share how hard life is? Or how, man, God told me this and I've been waiting for 25 years and it hasn't happened. I'm disappointed. My heart's hard. I'm angry. I'm bitter at God. That's where she's at. But does she come out? Does she talk about it? Is she, does she share that with Jesus at the dinner table? No. She conceals it. And then she lies to his face. And she's the type of woman that, that wants the last word, I think. But Jesus, I don't think, lets her have it. He doesn't. He says, no, she says, I did not laugh. For she was afraid. Out of fear, she lied. Out of fear, Abram told the Egyptian Pharaoh that Sarah was his sister. Out of fear, he slept with Hagar. Fear never drives faith. At least not with these guys. So out of fear, she lies to the Lord Jesus. Then he says, no, 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 no. No, but you did. And then they walk outside. We see that they're going to talk about justice and righteousness. Verse 16. The men set out from there. So like, man, I'm done with this conversation. Sarah, no, you did lie. Your heart is hard. Let's go, guys. We got, I got to talk to you now, Abram. Now, imagine this is pretty awkward, right? You just had dinner, great dinner, great dinner. Jesus shows up. He rebukes your wife. He, all right, let's go. Let's, where are we going, Jesus? I'm so sorry. Uh, I apologize. Um, we didn't, it was my fault. Like, I didn't tell her we were going to host. Uh, like, we really screwed this one up, Jesus. Like, I, I don't know what to say. Like, I'm a bit embarrassed. Like, that's, <laughs> that's what I would be. Like, <laughs> he, oh, man, he's like just hanging his head. And they sat outside. And so uh, Abram, and Abram went with him. He's like, man, I, either I'm going to stay in here with, G, in, with my wife, which that didn't go well. I got to go walk outside with these guys. Like, it's not good for Abram right now. In, in verse 17, the Lord said, I shall, shall I hide from Abram what I'm about to do? So Abram's probably walking, catching up. Like, all right, Jesus, I'm going to go hang out with you guys. I want to stay inside. She's angry, not going to do this. And, and he's talking to the angels and he's saying, shall I hide what I'm about to do from Abram? Seeing that, I, that Abram shall become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So he, they're having this conversation. And he says this about Abram. For I've chosen him. I've elected him. He is my man. He is the one. Look at this, that he, may, that, that he may command his children. So he's talking to Abram now about being a father. He just talked to, to Sarah, and now he's talking about, hey, Abram, like, you got to raise up your kids. He says this, his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. So he's like, hey, I need you to raise up the next generation that doesn't mock me, who, who worships me. Right now, your wife is mocking me. We're going to work on that. She's going to have to repent of that. Abram, you need to lean into that. But also, you're going to have kids with her. I need you to see what righteousness and justice is like. So let's have a conversation about righteousness and justice. Any ever, anyone ever thought of a great time in our world to talk about a righteousness and justice conversation? Now's the time in our day and age. And he's going to do it. And I want you to know that the conversation that the Lord Jesus is going to have with Abram about righteousness and justice is not the one that the culture is having. So prepare yourself for what the Word of God says about righteousness and justice. And just be okay with not agreeing for a little bit. And then we'll repent of that later. So the Lord may, uh, so so that the Lord may bring to Abram what is promised. So I need you to be righteous and just. I need you to bring up your kids in this way. And he says this, that the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So what's happening here is that what he's saying is, hey, you got to teach your kids what's right, what's just. You need to train up your kids to, to, to know, to discipline them in the ways of God, to know biblical righteousness and biblical justice. And so what does he do? He says first, man, I'm hearing the cries of the oppressed. I'm hearing the cries of of those who've been sinned against in Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to find out later that, man, sexual morality next, like incest, like every, they, they were just wicked in Sodom and Gomorrah. And apparently I, I, that people have been praying about, the, about the, the outcry. They've been out crying out to the Lord, the oppressed, the, the, those who've been sinned against about that, what's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so what is, this is the lesson we learn about righteousness and justice. That when we, 
First thing we do, we hear the cries of the oppressed. We hear the cries. God hears, the, Jesus hears the cries of the oppressed. And what does he say? Let me go check it out. Let me go check it out. This is wisdom. And we don't have this verse on the screen, but if you think about it, remember it. Proverbs 18, 17 says, the one who states his case first seems right until another comes and examines him. What he's saying here is like, I got to go down and check this out. I got to go check it out. The outcries are crazy. It, what's going on, apparently Sodom and Gomorrah is awful. I'm going to go down there, Abram. And you're, you're going to be a man who's going to lead the future generations in the ways of righteousness and justice. And so there's some awful stuff that's going on there. Their sin is very grave. And so I need to go down there and check on it to see if it's as bad as it really is. That's lit- and he says, I'll, I'll come down. To, and he says, if not, I'll know. Like, I'll know if it's right or not. God, Jesus is like, let me go check it out. So this is what we do. This is, this is examining, seeing. Not everything you hear on the news is exactly how, like, please, everyone, we all can agree to some point. Like, no one in the news is trying to give you the truth. Like, we all, like, I don't care right or left. You know that they're not trying to get you the truth. You know that. And if you don't know that, we can have a conversation after. I'm just saying everything you hear, you need to take Jesus' posture and go, okay, let me, let me examine this. I mean, I, we believe in righteousness. We believe in justice. We believe in, in, in caring for the oppressed and, and being near to the broken. We absolutely do. But if the Lord Jesus is willing to take his, come down from heaven, eat a meal with, 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 with Abraham and his wife, rebuke his wife, and then go say, hey, let's go down to Sodom and Gomorrah and let's figure this thing out. Before I, what, guess what he's going to do? Destroy it. I think we should consult and, and use wisdom and just like the proverb says, until we figure out what's true. Let's examine it. So some of you have heard accusations about another pastor or another church or another this or another that, and you believe it when someone says it. Do you examine it or do you just take it at face value? You see a meme, do you just believe it or, you, or do you examine it? Like, do you examine the cases, because this if you don't, it's called slander, by the way. It's a sin. If you don't examine something and you accuse a man or a woman of something that, they, that is false, like you're slandering them. That's a sin. So here he goes. So the men t- turned from there and went towards Sodom. So the angels are going to head towards Sodom. But Abram stood before the Lord. Then Abram drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? So he's like, man... Okay, God, I, get, I believe you're a just God, but like, what about the, the righteous? Are you going to kill them too? And he says this, suppose there were 50 righteous people within the city. Will you sweep, will you sweep then, or will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for 50 righteous people who are in it? Far be it for me to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so the righteous fare as the wicked. And then he says, okay, far be it from you. Like, I won't do it. I won't do it. He says, because he, he's asking him, in the end of verse 25, shall you not do, judge rightly, righteously? Are you not just God? And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole city for their sake. Good point, Abram. Like, I will spare it. There's 50. And Abram answered, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord I am but dust and ashes. He's like, okay, 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 hold, hold on. God. Suppose uh, there, were, there were five of the 50 uh, righteous were lacking. So 45, God, let me do a little trick question. Five minus 40, or 50 minus five. What about those? What about those? Will you destroy the whole city on the lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy if I find 45 there. And again, he spoke to him and said, suppose 40 were found there. And he answered, for, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, Lord, <laughs> do not be angry. He's like, he realizes he's pushing his buttons. Like, Lord, don't be angry with me. He's like the reverse auctioneer. It's like he's not getting higher in number. He's getting lower in number. He's trying to sell him on this. What about, what about, Lord? Don't be angry. Suppose 30 were found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 were found there. And he answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he says, oh, let not the Lord be angry. I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 were found there. And he said, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord said, and then the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. He's all right, I'm done. 10. Look at this. He said, hey, the reason what's going on in, 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 in the heart of Abraham is that his nephew Lot lives there. 
He just rescued him out of Sodom when they got captive. And his, he, he, Lot and his family are back in Sodom. They're back. And, and he's like, man, I don't want you to destroy the city. Like, Lot's one of us. He's, he's righteous with us. I know he's a fool. I know he acts, he's a lot of trouble, that blot. And so, like, I, I just, can you, can you spare it for his sake? He says, yeah, for ten people. We're going to find out. This is what we're going to find out. God is going to destroy the entire city. He goes down and he's going to investigate. And in this investigation, he finds out the cries of the city and the sin are great. But guess what? Everyone is guilty. Those who are even crying out for justice are wicked and perverted and are going to be destroyed as well. Like, you need to understand this is, God is the God of justice. It's his call. It's not ours. And so Abram has pleaded. He's praying for them. He wants them to repent, be right. Hey, if 50 of you can be righteous, you're not going to die. I want you to know just because, I want you to see this. Romans 3 tells us that we're, none of us are righteous. Not even one. Not one human who eats, lives, breathes on earth is righteous. And so when we cry out for justice, we cry out for righteousness to be done. We need to understand that you could, without the Lord Jesus, without confessing your sins to the Lord Jesus, without the forgiveness and salvation of the Lord Jesus, your cries for justice and your cries for righteousness are not any better than the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. For there will be a appointed day where God will wipe away Sodom and Gomorrah. There's a appointed day where Sarah will have a child. There was an appointed day where the Lord Jesus hung in your place for your sins. And there is an appointed day where he is coming back. And there is an appointed day where you will meet him face to face. Not just you, but the entire world. There's an appoint, there is an appointed day for judgment. And we'll look at, we'll examine Sodom and Gomorrah. There was a lot of unrighteousness that was going on. There was a lot of justice that needed to be served. But just because they were crying out for justice and righteousness did not mean that they were exempt from the gospel of Jesus. They, were, they, they needed to be saved like Abram was saved. So God is the righteous judge. He's going to go down and he's going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. And there's not even going to be ten who are righteous. But those who are, Lot and his family will be saved. There's a little detail there if you know the story. And we'll talk about next week. So God is this God of justice. And what Abraham is doing, he's talking to, to the Lord Jesus. He's having a conversation. It's what we call prayer. He's praying to him. He's asking questions. Hey, how is this going to go down? What if he's praying for the souls? He's praying for his family. He's praying for Lot. He wants righteousness to be done. He wants justice to be done. But Abraham had to learn a lesson that everyone is guilty, that righteousness only comes through faith. And this is how Abraham was made right, right? He, we heard that he believed God and it was counted to him or credited to him as righteousness. And so the way we're gonna respond today is we're actually gonna look, we're, we're gonna examine, we're gonna feast around the table in which signifies and represents God's mercy and justice colliding. It's the death, it's the burial of the, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, where Jesus hangs in your place for your sins, dies a death that you deserve to give you the life that he earned. Like it's literally, we call it the Lord's Supper. It's a meal where we gather together to eat of the bread, drink of the cup, to remember the saving death of the Lord Jesus. It's Jesus showing that he is hospitable to anyone. Actually, everyone, anyone who would call upon his name can be saved. The wages of sin is indeed death, but there's a gift that God gives. It's eternal life, it's righteousness, and it's found in the, the broken body and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. So I think it's interesting here that Jesus shows up and they have a feast. But the feast that we have is a representation of, of, of what the conversation is having here about righteousness and justice. Jesus is the only righteous. We are wicked sinners Jesus dies in our place for us. And so we're going to go to the table. We're going to remember that Jesus has mercy on us. Forgiveness 
to us because he's died for us. And if you have faith in him, you've been cleansed. And so if you have faith in the Lord Jesus, but you find yourself like Sarah today, bitter, hard-hearted, angry, cursing God, laughing at him, your heart's hard, your heart's hard, I want you to respond by confessing that to the Lord Jesus. He knows. He died for that sin. Confess it to him. Own it. That's me. Don't be like Sarah and go, no, 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 and lie. Own it. Turn from it. Plead with the Lord Jesus for a new heart. Ask him to soften your heart if it's hard. Some of you may be resisting to show hospitality, and you know that the Lord is, is trying to get you to be hospitable. May you, may you resolve today in the presence of God to follow in obedience as he leads. No matter where you're at today, wherever you're at today, I want you to know some of you take yourself way too seriously. You're offended. You're struggling. You're bitter at God. You don't know how to put all, these, all this together. The sermon's gone long. Don't worry. I cut out about 15 minutes of it, so you're welcome. Like, you're there, and you, you're just so serious and frustrated I just want you to repent of your taking yourself so seriously. Take the Lord Jesus seriously. He's serious about you. So serious about you that he chased you. So serious about you he died for you. So serious that he offers you his life. He loves you. Remember that's how he started? God showing up. He, reminding them and assuring Abraham and Sarai of the covenant he's made with them. Today we're going to end our time by being reminded of the covenant that the Lord Jesus had made with us. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I ask that we would look to you, remember your sin atoning sacrifice, remember your death on the cross in our place for our sins, remember that salvation was offered, remember, remember that there's more mercy in you than sin in us, and then therefore, because that is true, may we run to you. May we run to you with our bitterness, our, our hardness of heart, our, our confessing our sin. May we run to you with our, our fears. May, you, may we run to you with our, where we feel un, insecure or where prejudice have, been, have come to mind, like where, where our hearts are grumbling. Lord, wherever we find ourselves, may we run to you with it, knowing that if you atone for our past, our present, and our future sins, then you know them. And you love us the same. You've already paid the penalty for them. If we trust you, then they are cleared. Our debt has been paid. We have been made white as snow. And may we therefore respond with joy and gladness as we feast upon the table, as we remember your broken body, Lord Jesus, as we remember your shed blood, as we remember that you were hospitable to us, that you've chosen today to appear in our presence and meet with us and dine with us. You visited us. Now may we not leave here, Lord, in a, in a posture that is moving away from you, but may we leave here, Lord, with a posture that's running towards you. Lord, move with power, Holy Spirit, as we respond. In Jesus' name, amen.